Well, uh, I was just telling them when we met a little earlier, why this uh, youth and truth? Literally incessantly in these last many years that I've been out meeting people and doing the work that we are doing, thousands and thousands of people have asked me this same question. Sadhguru, where were you twenty-five years ago? Where were you when I was twenty-five? <laughs> Why did you come so late? If you had met me when I was twenty, I would have done this, this and this, but you came so late. So I thought we will step out and meet all those people in the country who are below twenty-five years of age. And here we are <laughs> So essentially, life means a certain amount of time and energy. This is what we call as life. And fortunately, most people forget this. Oh, this person has covered his face completely. There's something… Oh, that's <laughs> much I didn't know it's you <laughs> uh, The videos will be out soon, so don't worry <laughs> So, essentially life is certain combination of time and energy. Time is slipping away for all of us at the same pace, which most people don't realize when they're young. And energy is at its best when you're youthful which also most youth don't realize, they think they're going to be like this forever. It's not so, energies will deplete and go down. So when energies are at your peak and time is anyway running out for everybody, if only if we can bring little more clarity and balance to that life that we call as youth, I think tremendous things can happen. Above all, every human being carries a certain genius within himself or herself. How many people manage to find the necessary balance and atmosphere for themselves where this genius will unfold? Unfortunately, that percentage is extremely minuscule right now. This is an effort to increase that percentage because if you bring the right atmosphere within yourself, one's genius will unfold. In our lives, if we do not do what we cannot do, it's not an issue. But in our lives, if we do not do what we can do, we are a disaster. If our own potential doesn't unfold, we will end up as a life who did not do what we could have done. So this is just an attempt, and India being a youthful nation, unless we create a focused, balanced, inspired youth, we could be a miracle if you do that. If we leave youth unfocused, imbalanced, uninspired, we have a recipe for a disaster. So, we thought we will reach out to you, so you can ask whatever kind of questions. Namaskaram Sadhguruji, it gives me immense pleasure on behalf of the entire IMB community to welcome you here. Thank you so much for taking the time out, sir. Uh, it's been a lot of uh, pleasure for me to uh, welcome Sadhguruji here. Sadhguruji, ever since that we know that you are coming here, so we've… Uh, our uh, forms have been floated with a lot of questions. <laughs> we have selected the but top… But why are you… why are you dressed like a bridegroom <laughs> I, I, I have a question for that. I have a question for that. I have a Is question for that. Is there something coming up today? Hopefully, yes. So, sir, it gives me immense pleasure, sir. Uh, so, we uh, have plethora of questions that we had. It's taken a lot of time to figure out the best questions. Sir, so, without wasting any time, let's get started, guys. So, Sadhguruji, one of the most trending questions that we have here on campus is FOMO, the fear of missing out. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we have the fear of missing out on activities, we have the fear of missing out on our placements, we have the fear of missing out on anything whatsoever under the roof. So, Sadhguruji, I have a question for you here, is when do we realize that it's the end, we have to stop this and this should not influence our decision making? I think a lot of our uh, community would resonate to this question and we want your perspective on this, sir. See, uh, fear of missing out, let's uh, look at life a little beyond uh, your… your stay in the educational institution is only a transition, hmm? only to equip yourself for something you have come. 
you have not come to an educational institution as a destination. It's a packaging place to package you nicely so that you can <laughs> You package pretty well today, no? Thank you, sir. <laughs> so, <clears throat> not making a commentary on education, but how we go through it about missing out, the fear of missing out. First of all, fear, let's address fear before we address missing out. Fear is always about what may happen or may not happen, right? Fear is not about what is… what we are experiencing right now. What will happen is always the fear. Or in other words, your fear is about something which is not yet. Your fear is about something which does not exist. This is all management people. If there were a few… somebody from a psychiatry department, you could have asked them, if I have fear about something that does not exist, what is my condition? They would have a title for you <laughs> Yes, Nimhans is close by, I think <laughs> We can always consult, that is also a premier institution. We are suffering something which doesn't even exist, yes? If you are suffering something that doesn't even exist, it is not about life, it is not about education, it's not about career, it is just about your mind being out of control. Is that not an important aspect that you should manage first before we allow you to manage an industry or a business. Is it not important, first of all, you learn to at least manage your mind? Hello? Isn't it important? Absolutely. If you do not know how to manage your mind, what the hell are you going to manage in the world? Managers are all freaking out and growing ulcers in their stomachs. Yes, today it's become normal. If you are a CEO by forty-five, if you don't have an ulcer, you are not a great CEO. <laughs> Because you are managing by accident like this, the fear comes because there is an accidental possibility, isn't it? Tell me, let's say you don't know how to ride a bicycle, you sat on it, it was on stand, you were just pedaling for fun and it came off stand and started rolling. Anxiety or no? Started rolling faster, fear or no? Very fast, terror or no? It's not because bicycle produces terror, it is just that you don't know how to ride. If you know how to ride, faster it goes, the better it is, hmm? isn't it? Faster it goes, the better it is. The very, very uh, basis why we created a bicycle is because we wanted to go, go faster than walking, that's the idea. But if you do not know how to ride, how much fear it creates? Right now your problem is not with the world, your problem is not with your education, your problem is your education system right from kindergarten hasn't told you a damn thing about how to manage yourself. They think you're going to manage the world without knowing how to manage yourself. When you are a mess, you can only create a mess, isn't it? You may be successful. Success happens for variety of reasons. You know, success is not always hundred percent yours. There are situations, there are times which support us in many different ways. Of course, your bit is there, but just because somebody is successful, this doesn't mean they've figured out everything, this doesn't mean they're at ease with life, this doesn't mean their life is in some way fulfilled, no. Because today our idea of success is just doing little better than somebody else. You doing little better than somebody else means, and you're very happy about that, what it means is you're actually enjoying other people's failures. If somebody enjoys another person's failure, I call that sickness, not success. What do you call it? Hello? <laughs> I enjoy that you failed. This is sickness, this is not success, isn't it? Unfortunately, this is how you are going. This is the reason why human potential is not unleashed. 
Because if you are racing with a lame person, you are just happy you are one step ahead of him. Only when you meet Mr. Bold, you understand who the hell you are. Yes? Till then you think you are a great runner because the other person doesn't have legs. <laughs> so it's very important that there is nothing to miss out in life. Life is happening to all of us. Hmm? Question is only, if I miss this party, am I missing out something? If I miss this examination, I am missing out something. If I miss this job, am I missing out something? This is simply because right now, who you are is not internally managed. It is externally stimulated. <laughs> you… you are still in a very controlled campus, a very beautiful campus you have, I have to say, wonderful campus. And uh, <clears throat> you are in a very controlled campus atmosphere. When you step out into the world, if you leave it to the people to decide what happens within you, they are going to drive you crazy in no time. Here it's all managed for you, you're not managing this. It's managed for you, what should happen to you, what should not happen to you, somebody else is managing it. When you step out on the street, if you leave it to other people's hands that they can decide whether you're happy or unhappy, you're going to be miserable for sure <laughs> because they're going to do many things. <laughs> what happens within you must be determined by you, isn't it? Hmm? And anyway, why are you copying people? Most people don't know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> this happened. Shankar and Pillai joined Pentagon. He was working in Pentagon. Then he kept moving his work table from one office to another office, another office to another office. He went on moving around. Then he moved to the corridor, he moved into the garden, he moved here, there. Then he moved into the men's restroom and settled down there and started working. Everybody was looking at this, what's wrong with him, some problem? Initially they thought he's a Russian agent, then… <laughs> then he thought he must be a Muslim terrorist. Then they thought all those things, then everything ran out, he didn't cause any harm to anybody. Then he settled down in the men's restroom and started working. So they told the Pentagon's psychiatrist, that this guy's gone loony, he's working in the men's room and he settled down and he's just doing his work there. So the psychiatrist just strolled in as if he wanted to use the men's room and started chatting. Then he found he was quite normal, everything was fine with him. He said, why are you sitting in the men's room and working? He said, I moved everywhere and saw, I, in the end I find this is the only damn place where people know what they're doing. <laughs> Thank you, Sadhguruji. Uh, my next question is, uh, we've all seen the movie Three Idiots and there is one dialogue I think that's… What happened to the remaining idiots? They left them here <laughs> <laughs> So there is one dialogue in the movie that <coughs> sort of resonates with a lot of us and it says, when friend fail, hota hai, toh dukh hota hai. But when friend pass or top, then more zyada dukh hota hai. <laughs> and… Uh, <laughs> and building on to how you're affected by what people do, is it… Uh, my question is, it is okay to have that feeling? And if not, how do you let go of that feeling in today's environment? See, uh, you… you know, Charles Darwin, you heard of Charles Darwin? There's something called as evolution. And nobody told you it's all complete. Today, some of the neuroscientists are saying the DNA difference between a chimpanzee and you is only 1.23 percent. 1.23 percent is not much of a difference, isn't it? <laughs> huh? So there is an evolutionary issue. If you don't take charge of yourself, very easily you will step back 1.23 percent. <laughs> Now, if… Uh, what is that? I, I can't repeat that sentence, but anyway, if your friend uh, is… Uh, doesn't not do well, you'll feel sad about it. If he does very well, you'll feel very sad about it. <laughs> so you have fixed yourself in such a way, whichever way you cannot be happy. <laughs> you… you're in a self-defeating mode, no matter what happens, you will not be happy. 
If you want to understand what I'm saying, you go and stand out on one of the main streets in Bangalore city. Leave the poor people who are uh, selling karlekai on the street side, leave them. People who are driving there, only look at those uh, BMWs, Mercedes and Maseratis and whatever is going around in Bangalore city, only look at the dream cars, okay? Because many of you may have dreams also of this. Just look at all these people, you think they are in a profusion of joy driving this car like that? No, only in case it's a stolen car, you see the joy <laughs> Otherwise, uh, no. So success has not brought joy, brought joy to them. If they're failed, of course they're frustrated. Because the very mode of approach is like this, if this mode of approach comes, whichever way it's not going to work, because it's not even about you, it's always about somebody here, it's never about you. The simple thing is this, see, if your joy, your sadness, your happiness, your misery is determined by something or somebody around you, the chances of you being joyful in your life is remote. Yes or no? Is it true that human experience is created from within? Hello? Hello? I'm asking all of you. Is it true that human experience, joy or misery, agony or ecstasy, madness or sanity, everything is created from inside? Yes. At least if you're a manager, if you're going to be a manager, at least what is happening from within you must happen your way. Because essentially management means having situations the way we want it. Yes? Management means what? Having situations the way we want it. Well, if the world is not happening your way, at least this one must be happening your way, otherwise what kind of management is this? Here there's only one person, huh? Here there are thousand people, they may not listen to you, they got their own stuff. But here there's only one person, at least here what you want must happen, isn't it? If what you want happened, would you keep yourself blissed out or miserable? What's your choice? You must choose, I'm going to bless you now <laughs> If you had a choice, would you be rather be blissed out or miserable? Huh? Blissed out, of course. So if such a thing is not happening, then all these problems come. If things work, it is a problem. If they don't work, it's a problem. If you get a seat in this institution, it's a problem. If you cannot get out of this, it's a problem <laughs> You like this place so much, you don't mind staying here, it's not like that. You must get in and you must get out ahead of others, everything. It's never about you, it's always about something else. Outside is a variable situation. Who these people are today, tomorrow we don't know what they will say, yes? Tomorrow morning we don't know what they will say. If your way of being is determined by all these people, then you are a mess, you're bound to be a mess. When you're a mess like that, see, you call yourself a friend. If they fail, you're unhappy. If they pass, you're very unhappy. Definitely we should not use the word friend in this context. Yes, competition. I agree, not a friend, isn't it? If your friend does well, shouldn't you be very happy if they're really friendship? <laughs> Leave the friendship business. Essentially, this problem is coming because we have not taken charge of this fundamental human mechanism. This is not happening the way you want it. Is it true that your body right now is the greatest chemical factory on the planet? It is so. It is the most complex and sophisticated chemical factory on the planet. The question is only are you a great CEO or a lousy CEO? <laughs> because if you're a great CEO, you would create chemistry of bliss. If you're a lousy CEO, all these things will happen. Your industry should run the way you want it, isn't it? At least this one little industry <laughs> So, most of us here at IIM Bangalore have been consistent achievers, at least in some domain or the other, for all our lives. 
but some time at i am bangalore is good enough to make you feel that you are not good enough so how do you deal with the pressure of being relatively average it's best somebody makes you feel that right here because anyway that may happen in your life it can happen in your work it can happen in your family somebody will tell you you're not good enough <laughs> So whether they tell you or not, I want you to understand, none of us are ever really good enough. If you have a large-scale intention in the world, you are never really good enough. People keep telling me, Sadhguru, you've done so many things, this project, that project. I'll tell you my project, because yes, day before yesterday I was the Chamundi Hill. This happened thirty-seven years ago. I went up Chamund Hill and sat there for no reason. I was overflowing with ecstasy, every cell in my body exploding. I didn't know what was happening. When I spoke to my closest friends, they said, tell me what did you drink, what did you pop? This is the only thing they could ask. When I asked my own skeptical mind, my mind said, maybe you're going off the rocker. But I knew. I've hit a gold mine. Something fantastic is happening within me without any reason. If I simply sit like this, I become so ecstatic. What I think is two minutes have gone into seven, eight hours. Have you noticed this? When you're very happy, time just poof. So if I close my eyes and open, it's like eight, ten hours are gone, like that. So at that time, I just planned. This is my plan. This is fantastic. If I simply sit here, I'm completely blissed out. Then I decided, at that time, the world's population was some 5.6 five, 5 billion people. I said, in two and a half years' time, I'm going to… I made a plan, a specific plan, how I will do it. In two and a half years' time, I'm going to have the entire world blissed out because it doesn't take anything. If you simply sit here, it happens. Well, thirty-seven years, <laughs> Well, we might have touched uh, maybe on five hundred, six hundred million people on the planet, but that's not my idea of the world. My idea of the world today is seven point six billion people. So I know I will die a failure, hundred percent. And everything else that I wish to do, I know I will not even fulfill probably ten, fifteen percent of what I want to do. But I will die blissfully, because I'm living blissfully and I will die blissfully. So it's best that you're a failure in your life, that means your vision is large. If you're a success, you have a constipated sense of life <laughs> Success means what? I made it. What did you make? I bought a house site. You would think that's an achievement. I got a job. I made this much money. This is a very constipated way of looking at life. I want young people to look at it in terms of how we can do something that cannot be done in this lifetime. Oh, what will happen if I don't fulfill it? If you… if you work incessantly and still at the end of your life the job is not done, it doesn't mean you're a failure. It means you had a great vision, <laughs> that's what it means. May you die as a failure, is that okay? Yeah, you should, blissed out failure, that means you're doing great, not a miserable success. <clears throat> People are not liking it, I think. <laughs> no, no, you don't have to clap. I, I just thought maybe those words are little… Scary failure. <laughs> uh, Satmuji, my next question is, uh, today, unfortunately, we're all living in a very stressful environment and with… Really? <laughs> I think it's air-conditioned, everything is fine. <laughs> Little more uh, cooling would be nice, but it's not stressful. <laughs> Some people perceive it to be, I'll rephrase. <laughs> Some people perceive it to be stressful and uh, you at times feel a little anxious or you feel depressed, but most often uh, I think the first battle is within yourself to identify that. 
And in that scenario, how do you reach out and not feel vulnerable about it, that you are stressed and <coughs> So stress is not about any situation or atmosphere. Stress is your in inability to handle your own thoughts, your own emotions, your own chemistry, your own energy. Stress is not about the situation. One situation that somebody thinks is stressful, another person is breezing through that situation. Is it not happening? You see bad drivers are going like this, cursing everybody. You'll see a young boy, boom, he just goes off. He's not stressful, he's very happy for the, all the obstacles that are there in Bangalore city. <laughs> yes or no? So stress is not a consequence of situations. Stress is a consequence of your inability to manage your own thought and emotion. Your thought and emotion must happen the way you want it, isn't it so? If this one thing happened, would you keep yourself blissful or miserable? Hundred percent, isn't it? So instead of doing that, you're trying to manage the entire world the way you want it, it's never going to happen. Never ever going to happen. Even if you are a family of two, it's not going to happen. <laughs> yes? Most of you are not married <laughs> I'm saying even if it's just two people at home, it will never happen hundred percent your way, unless you're living with a dead person. Fifty-one percent if it happens your way, you have the controlling stake, you must be happy. Hundred percent nobody will live with you, isn't it? Nobody will work for you, nobody will live with you, nobody will be around you if you insist hundred percent my way. I am glad the world is not happening your way, because if everything happened your way, where will I go? <laughs> little bit your way, little bit my way, little bit somebody else's way, eh, this is how the world should be. But this one must happen my way. There's no other way for this one. This one must happen my way. If this one person happened your way, do you think you'll be stressful? <laughs> Hi sir, so now I have a very trending question that everyone wants your perspective on. Sir, how do you know that the person you are with is the right person for you? <laughs> Whoa, popular, eh? <laughs> it was in the top of the lot. Can I tell you a joke? Can I tell you a joke? Sure, because you're in the clothing… <laughs> I, I, that is why I'm said like this, that is why I'm said like this. It's good you asked the question before the event. <laughs> It once happened, Shankaran Pillai was at the family dinner and uh, when everybody settled down for dinner, he stood up at the table and announced, I am going to marry Lucy who is just across the street. I hope that's not the name. No, oh. <laughs> Then. The father said, what? you going to marry Lucy? She has nothing, she's like a tramp. You're going to marry that Lucy? Mother said, what? You're going to marry that Lucy? She has no inheritance, she has no family. The uncle, uncle's always pitching in these kind of matters, you know <laughs> Uncle said, what? You're going to marry that Lucy? Have you seen her hair? It looks fake. The aunt, what, you're going to marry Lucy? She's… she's always painted. You're going to marry the painted woman? The little boy, the nephew can't be left out. He said, you're going to marry Lucy? She doesn't even know what is cricket. How can you marry her? Shankaran Pillai stood his ground and said, yes, I'm going to marry Lucy. Everybody asked in one voice, why? He said, because she has no family <coughs> There are no many opinions to battle with <laughs> So, who is the right person? I, I don't want to take away all the romance from your life <laughs> But let me tell you this, there is no right person on this planet. If you put your heart into something, something may become wonderful. 
Is it the right thing? There's no right thing. Nobody ever found the right person anywhere, okay? If you get into that kind of unrealistic mindset, I have found the right person, oh, you will be soon disappointed. <laughs> you must understand, there is no right person. First thing is to see whether I am the right person. Yes, am I the right person? Instead of seeing, is this the right person? Am I the right person, first of all? And there are no right people on this planet. If you understand, you have your nonsense, they have their nonsense. We can adjust nonsense to nonsense. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> we must understand relationships are formed for various needs. There are physical needs, there are psychological needs, there are emotional needs, there may be social needs, there may be financial needs, various kinds of needs. So when you are going to somebody with so many needs, you are going as a beggar and a beggar cannot choose. Hello? Beggar eat what comes his way, isn't it? He cannot choose. So if you really want to make a choice in this world, first and foremost thing is, you bring yourself to your place. I'm again going back to the same thing, where your experience of life is just pleasant by yourself, you're wonderful. Now, let us see what gets drawn to this one. If you're really wonderful, things will happen in every way, I'm saying. In terms of career, in terms of marriage, in terms of relationships, the best will happen to you because you made yourself like this. Instead of trying to work on somebody and fix them, if you work upon yourself and make you so wonderful that everybody wants to be with you, then there is a choice. Right now, when you're going out of your compulsive needs, you are a beggar. Beggars should not choose, they must eat what comes their way. And this whole thing is an American thing that there is a soulmate somewhere. God made just one more person just for you. But these days, every two years, he keeps making one more person <laughs> just for you. <laughs> Obviously, God is making too many mistakes with you <laughs> Now, this soulmate business, first of all, I don't like to use that word, but now we have… you uttered the word. See, body needs a mate, understandable. Maybe psychologically also you need a mate, understandable. Emotionally you need a mate. A soul cannot need a mate. Even if your soul needs a mate, it needs evolution, isn't it? So soul doesn't need a mate, nor was some person made perfectly for you, okay? This creation makes uh, all kinds of unique idiots. If you understand you are one kind of idiot and the others are different kind, you will be… you will understand their nonsense because you know you got your stuff. If you think you're perfect and God has chosen you and he's made another person perfect somewhere else, you're heading for a disaster, <laughs> okay? <laughs> There's no such thing. Even, uh, you know, people today, after five thousand years, people are still audulating and worshipping Krishna as the greatest lover, but his wives are dead unhappy with the guy <laughs> Yes. So, you're not going to find any perfect person. If you invest a deep sense of involvement, something wonderful may happen. It's because of your involvement, not because the other person is fantastic, no. Even if you choose a fool, actually it's easy that way. If they're not stupid, why would they come to you first of all? <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> I'm just being nasty. <laughs> So, even if you choose a fool, it doesn't matter. If you involve yourself, it can turn out very beautiful. You chose the smartest person in the universe, it could be a disaster. So, do not think in terms of, uh, you know, whatever this made for each other nonsense. No. You choose the opposite, actually. The genders are opposites. You choose the opposite because you don't want them exactly like you, you want them some other way. 
The reason why a ball is, boy is attracted to a girl and a girl to a boy is because they're different. But after some time, after a little bit of time, you slowly start expecting they're just like you. This is a serious mistake. Because if one more person becomes just like you, you won't be able to bear with them for two days. Hello? Please tell me. <laughs> There's one more person just like you at home, could you live there? You're glad they're different. It's wonderful, nobody is like you, isn't it? Nobody is like you on this planet. Try and see, nobody is like you and that's good. Don't look for sameness, not necessary. It's a difference which makes the… Because of the difference you tango, not otherwise <laughs> So, Guruji, then in that case when we… Uh, or what I understand is then we should not find similarities of ourselves to someone else. Then why do we have role models? Role models? People keep asking me, Sadhguru, who is your role model? I tell them I don't roll with the models <laughs> You see all these things you're picking up from Western cultures, here we never created a role model. Just look back on this culture and see. This is about it, constantly striving to evolve yourself. Role model essentially means you planted a mango tree and a coconut tree together. Coconut tree went straight up and tall. Mango tree saw, oh, I need to be like him and chopped off all its own branches and left one like this. This is going to be a lousy mango tree. Yes? You don't need a role model. The thing is, we are trying to drive people, young people especially, with either carrot or stick. Offer them something, otherwise beat them a little bit. This is like being a circus monkey. You want the circus monkey to do tricks, you give it a banana, it will do trick and again it will sit like this. Again you have to hang another banana there, otherwise it won't do. Don't become like this, all of you especially, I see, uh, I'm not saying about this institution, across the world I've spoken in every business institution. I see it's become so unhealthy. Everybody is thinking, what will I get, what will I get, what will I get, what will I get? Very few people are thinking, what can I create? What the hell are you going to get at the end of your life anyway? Will either bury you or cremate you? That's all you will get? Which, do, which one do you prefer? <laughs> because sometimes you even get fired for that reason. Once happened, Shankaran Pillai got fired from his job. See, I'm just telling you because you're in a school right now, here they can't fire you generally, unless you do something totally wrong probably. But outside, you know, small things you can get fired. As market economy grows and multiplies, people can get fired just like that. Shankaran Pillai got fired just because he asked a simple question, smoking or non-smoking? Why for such a simple thing a man must be fired? But what he was supposed to ask is cremation or burial. So, what is it that you're going to get at the end of this life? You will get nothing. The only thing is, did you live an intense and involved life? That's all you have. What have you got? What have I got? What have you got? What have I got? This is rubbish. But this has got… particularly into business schools, this has gotten big time. In the United States, business school, nobody is thinking of anything. What's your first salary? The previous batch, what did they get the first salary? I must get little more than that. This is all because everything has become goal-oriented. There's no significance for the process. You know, we have business events every November. I think some shots were there of Ratan Tata and others. All the major leaders, business leaders in the country have come. Every year we have two hundred CEOs who go through four and a half days of training called Insight. Last year, one of this, you know, somebody who was running a reasonably major mm, multinational company said, Sadhguru, we picked the best from the IIMs and IITs in the country. 
and we keep paying them more and more year after year. But you, you don't have single I am here. I said, I all have only school dropouts. But your organization runs better managed than our corporation. How's this? I said, see, this is all it is. You guys are goal-oriented. You want to get somewhere. Here, people who are working for me, they don't even know where to go. They don't even care where they go. All they know is they are absolutely devoted to the process. Right now, what they're doing? They're so absolutely devoted to it, everything that's there in them is coming out in that single action. This is all a human being can do. Either you're doing your best or not doing your best, isn't it? You may not be able to do as well as somebody, but the question is, are you doing your best in every moment of your life? For this, you need devotion. I'm specifically using the word devotion because devotion means people think going to the temple or church or mosque or whatever is their destination. No. You tell me, has anybody in any field of uh, activity, either sport, music, art, business, spirituality, politics, whatever, has anybody reached any significant states of achievement without being devoted to what they're doing? Have they? Has anybody gotten anywhere, I'm asking? Mediocre nonsense they've done, they maybe got more and more salary, but they did not do anything significant. So you have to decide whether you want to live a mediocre life or you want to live a, an intense, beautiful life. Because life is only in its experience, in not what you possess. Hmm? Life is only in the way you experience it, not in what you have. What you have will mock at you after some time. If your experience is not good, people can live in a palace and be terrible. People are committing suicides in palace, isn't it? So, what you possess is not at all the point. How you experience it, everything is the point, isn't it? But right now, the entire world has gone towards this direction. You young people must change this. The intensity of your experience is more important than the immensity of your possessions, isn't it? So one last question from our side is that, um, so as we enter a B school or any new sphere of our lives, we might have a vague idea or direction as to where we're headed. But the people around you might create an impression that yes, this is the place to be or this is the job that you should have or this is the car you should have. So it leads to a group think of sorts. So how do you decide what is the best for you and not get influenced by the externalities that we were discussing before? and internalize all this? I'm asking you a simple question, all of you who are students here. Is your life, your life, I'm talking about your life, is it a precious life? Yes. I want you to understand this. Even a so-called insignificant ant, if you try to catch him, he shows how significant his life is for him, yes or no? He doesn't think, I'm just an ant, you can crush me. No, his life is very precious for him and that's so for you. If your life is so precious, is it not important where you are going to invest this life? Hmm? You're going to invest this life simply because somebody's going to pay you a little more. You're going to invest your life simply because your friend is going to a lesser company and you're feeling very good about that. This is not the way. When such a question arises in your mind, you must withdraw from the influence of your peers, your parents, your teachers, the atmospheres that you normally live in, just a small amount of time, maybe five, ten days, where you're well supported so that you don't have to fight for survival. You're supported but you're not influenced to such a place and really look at this, where do I want to invest my life, into what? What… what is it truly worthwhile for this life to be involved in for the rest of my life? When you are not unhappy, 
when you're not frustrated, when you're not jealous, when you're not hateful or resentful, when you're peaceful and happy, you must decide what you wish to do. Once you decide, you shouldn't be every day looking who is doing better, who is doing better, who is doing better. Nobody is doing better than anybody. Either you're doing great or you're just lousy, that's all there is. Yes, within yourself, in your experience of life, either you're doing great or you're having a lousy life, that's about it. Nobody is doing better than somebody, nobody is happier than somebody else. Either you're joyful or you're not, isn't it? So you must invest in your life what you think is truly worthwhile. It doesn't matter what it gives because, you know, in the end, do you know this, there is no cargo ship going with you? Hello? <laughs> There's no cargo ship going with you, so possessions are only for our use, not to accumulate. Yes? What we can use, we must have, of course. But it is not just to have something against somebody else, most people's ho houses are like warehouses. <laughs> They're living in warehouses because most of the stuff, at least Seventy to eighty percent of the stuff in most homes are never used, they're just warehousing it. They have no space to move, they have to clean it every day, but lots of things they got because neighbors bought it. <laughs> it's time because this is sensible for your life and this is sensible for the planet. So, Sadhguruji, we also have a set of e-media questions mm -hmm. that have come to us. So, we would like to address the name of the person and the question that we've got. So, we have a question from Erin Hestrong. He… Uh, just to give a little bit of context, we saw the video of Sadhguruji running on Himalayas, playing football, playing cricket. So, sir, in that context, how to keep yourself on the go all the time? On the go? You don't have to be on the go all the time. If life demands, People ask me, Sadhguru, how are you active like this? Because generally my schedule is anywhere between eighteen to twenty hours a day, seven days of the week, three sixty-five days, non-stop. For many years it's going on. Why, why, why? Hey, I'm… I'm complaining and the guy is clapping about it <laughs> So people keep asking, how do you keep yourself like this? How do you do this? See. I'm essentially lazy. It's just that the situation in the world demands action. Left to myself, I would close my eyes and simply sit. I'm made like this, if I close my eyes, I can sit like this till I fall dead. Really, I have really no need for action. I'm not trying to keep myself busy. There's a lot to be done, so you're doing. People ask me, Sadhguru, what's your dream? What is your dream? I said, my dream is the day I'm unemployed, that's a great day. Because if I'm unemployed, it simply means everybody is doing fantastic. What more do you want? Dream fulfilled <laughs> So, action is not something that you decide. You just decide your intent. Action, the world will decide how much of what. I… I'm, you know, at these economic forums and stuff, I'm at the Ec World Economic Forum. This guy from one of the business schools in Harvard Business School, one professor comes, Oh, you're that amazing tree planter? I said, No, I'm not a tree planter <laughs> He said, No, no, you planted those millions of trees. Yes, I did, but I'm not a tree planter <laughs> Then what do you do? I said, uh, I make people flower, not plant trees, but I'm planting trees because the goddamn trees are missing where they should have been. Where they should have been, they are not there. It's like this. Two men were working on the street. One man is digging pits, behind him another man is coming and closing and closing and going. Somebody else was driving by. They saw this ridiculous activity. One guy digs the pit, another guy closes the pit. So they stopped and said, Hey, what are you doing here? Why are you guys working like this? One guy digging, another guy closing. They said, no, no, uh, the in-between guy has gone and leave, he's the tree planter <laughs> He's not there, we're doing our work. So a lot of people are doing work like this, I'm doing my work. You have no work on this planet, 
If the planet needs work, if the world needs work, we will do it. Otherwise, why should I think this is my work? Sadhguru, what's your mission? He said, no mission, I'm just fooling around a bit <laughs> because you have no business to have your own mission. Life has its own mission. In some way, if you can assist and serve that, that's about it. What is it that you have your own mission? Are you some kind of a tyrant? All missionaries are tyrants in some way, unknowingly. Yes, those who think they have a mission, there is no mission. What is needed, you do, especially when you study in a business school and get certain competence to manage things or create things. You must create what is needed, not create some rubbish and push it on them. Yes? Yes or no? Yes. You must see how to make life better, how to solve situations which are problematic to a whole lot of people. You must look for solutions and solutions for the existing situations. And of course, there are experts who go on creating new problems. So you will never be short of problems, believe me. You just have to create solutions, not go on a mission mode. <coughs> That's for Mussolini. Sadhguruji, Shilpa wants to know, I think, and we've been discussing this uh, for a long time, that you shouldn't set a goal, you should enjoy the process. Uh, but how do you be less goal-oriented in life and follow your passions? And also, is… aren't her passions also a goal? <laughs> See, less goal-oriented goal, goal means what? Have a goal and not get there? Or have a small goal? What is it? Less goal-oriented. See, what you're calling as a goal is a consequence, isn't it? If you're only focused on the consequence and not on the process, then your consequence will just be an unfulfilled dream in your life, just a desire which will be unfulfilled. Only if you conduct this process right, consequence will happen. Maybe not necessarily that you… the way you thought, maybe it'll happen in some other way, but the consequence is bound to happen, isn't it, if you're conducting the process right? It's like uh, growing flowers in your garden. If you want flowers in your garden, you don't have to do flower meditation. You don't even have to think of flower. Probably you don't even know what flower will come out. But you need to think soil, manure, water, sunlight. None of them look or feel or smell like flowers. But if you handle them right, flowers will happen. This is how life works, this is life's process. If you do not engage in the life's process, if you do not figure out what is the life's process, then you will only desire. Desires are very exhilarating to have in the beginning. Later on, that's what makes people frustrated. If you just look at people's faces, I'm not making any commentary on any people here, I'm saying just look at people's faces in the world. Look at your own face when you are five years of age, your face was like this. Slowly becomes like this. After this event, <laughs> get a little more and more sober. Slowly, the way people are walking, I'm afraid they may scratch their chin on the floor. It's becoming so long. I was addressing a group of people at the Princeton University. I just looked around, there were about three hundred fifty, four hundred people, all of them. <laughs> Especially in the universities, they have extra long faces. Maybe it's a weight of knowledge. <laughs> I just looked around, only about four or five young people who were sitting there, they were little lively, all others like this. If I tell them a joke, they agree with me <laughs> Then after about forty, forty-five minutes of talking, then I say, What's happened to all these people over thirty years of age? Why are they carrying such long faces? One lady stood up and said, they're all married <laughs> So this question is from Satish. He says that, I am not able to decide my profession. 
whether I need a job or should I carry on with the business. My father and society affect my mind and now I'm at the stage of nowhere. How should I know what I'm really for? I think we already answered this question in a certain way. You need to see what is truly worthwhile for this life to be invested into. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what they think. I think to cure you of this disease, one thing that we need to do is socially we need to do something in this country. In this country we have this problem, one profession is in the sky, another profession is yes, here. Yes. This needs to go. It has to happen that an electrician, a plumber, a carpenter has to be on the same level as a doctor, engineer and whatever else. Can I include your thing also? The manager <laughs> Only because we kept them so low, we have such low skills in those areas. Today, uh, in India, you have carpenters. If he fixes a door, if you close it, you can't open it. If you open it, you can't close it. <laughs> you must check the men's room, whoever is the carpenter, he's just removed the bolt and everything so that <laughs> I don't know if it's intentional or that's the way it is <laughs> So I'm saying we have such carpenters. I must tell you this, I've been telling this to a lot of people because this came into my memory once again because I started riding motorcycles. Those were times when I was riding crisscrossing India without any destination, simply. So sometimes I ride three days and three nights non-stop. <laughs> This was something that, you know, I kind of managed within myself doing certain things that without sleep, riding for three nights and three days. So this is one night, full night I've ridden early morning. I'm somewhere in uh, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh border. I stop for a cup of tea and some… maybe something to eat. My… Uh, normally I handle my own motorcycle because I'm always on the road. I don't want to trust that with anybody else. <laughs> but I've just ridden the whole night and stopped here at a dhaba. Next to that I saw a garage, Mubarak Mechanical Works. So handwritten board. Then there was a strapping young youth. I said, hey, why don't you tighten my chain because it's a simple thing. Motorcycles, chains become loose of riding. So I said, all you have to do is take off a Lincoln, Tighten it a bit. I said, why don't you do it for me? So this guy came out with tools. The tools in his hand were a chisel and a hammer. I looked at this and said, okay, and I kept my tea and I came. <laughs> I said, wait, before you touch my motorcycle. <laughs> I went into his garage to see. The only tools he had in the garage was chisel and hammer. <laughs> he does everything with this chisel and hammer. But after he's done the job, nobody else can do anything with it anymore <laughs> So there's a whole lot of people in life that they're conducting their life like this. They got just one instrument. Right now, this instrument unfortunately is called intellect. Somebody is using it <laughs> If I ask you a question, do you want a sharp intellect or a dull intellect? You must choose, I'm going to bless you. Sharp or blunt? Sharp. So essentially, your intellect is a cutting instrument. It's like a knife. It slices through things. It dissects things and shows you a few things. But dissection is not a way of knowing entire life. I really want to know you a chunk. Can we dissect you? If we dissect you, will we know you? We may see your heart, kidney, liver and spleen, but we won't know a thing about you because you won't be there. Yes? yes? Maybe by including you, maybe by embracing you, I may know something. But by dissecting you, I will not know a thing about you, isn't it? So right now, you are using this sing… you are a single instrument mechanic. For everything intellect, a human being has many layers of intelligence, many dimensions of intelligence, but we have created an education system where intellect is the only thing that is regarded as intelligence. This is a cutting instrument. With a cutting instrument, 
If you try to do everything, no wonder. Suppose with a cutting instrument you try to sew, you will leave it in tatters, isn't it? That's all that's happening to life. Why every simple thing is a problem and a question is simply because we are using a cutting instrument to do everything in our life. There are other dimensions of intelligence, especially if you want to manage, let's say a thousand or ten thousand people in your life, which is what management means. It's very important, other dimensions of intelligence are on. With intellect, somebody who comes in front of you, you will try to dissect this guy and understand him. You'll make all the wrong conclusions. You must have a different dimension of intelligence and insight that if you see this person, you know what to do with him and what not to do with him. If this much sense doesn't come into you, with intellect if you go, you can talk a lot of management but you won't be able to manage much. If you do manage much, you will get ulcers. You won't joyfully manage anything because when you do something that you're not competent to do, it will give you hell, isn't it? Hello? If I give you just five balls and ask you to juggle, it'll drive you crazy. Suppose this is the examination for you this time, if you want to pass your MBA, you must manage five balls juggling. You want to pass? <laughs> it'll fall all over. What you're not competent of, if you try to do, you'll go crazy. So don't try to do something, don't try to elevate your activity. See how to elevate this. See, if you scale up your activity without scaling up this one, you will suffer activity immensely, isn't it? You don't try to up the activity, you scale this up, world will bring the activity to you. But nobody wants to invest time to scale this up. You must scale this being up. Don't worry, where is my job, where is my thing? The world will come to you, they have to come to you. If you are at a certain level of elevation, you think the world won't come to you? They will come to you, they cannot miss you. But instead of that, instead of scaling yourself up, you're scaling the activity and going crazy about doing activity. Even with education, I'm saying, don't try to understand and grasp and all this nonsense, there are ways to deep into deeper dimensions of intelligence within this. See, when I say deeper dimensions of intelligence, to put it very simply, what did you have for breakfast, Jasang? Ragi dosa. <laughs> okay. Ragi dosa. The boy is becoming Kannada. <laughs> Ragi dosa doesn't look like you, doesn't feel like you, doesn't look like any human being, isn't it? But you eat a ragi dosa, it goes inside. Over three, four hours' time it becomes you. Isn't it so? Mm -hmm. hmm? So there is an intelligence here which can turn a ragi dosa into a human being. Is it a small thing? Is it a small phenomenon, I'm asking? You've taken this for granted? If I can take a ragi dosa in my hand and make it into a human being, who do you think I am? Hello? God. God? Creator himself, isn't it? But every day you're doing this, but unconsciously. This is the human predicament. Whatever you are unconscious of, it does not exist for you, isn't it? Right now, look at the back of the hall, there's a huge dinosaur. Don't turn back, please <laughs> There's a huge dinosaur, such a big animal. But you are not conscious of it, it doesn't exist for you, isn't it? Such a huge animal, but you are not conscious, it doesn't exist. Similarly, right here, the very source of creation functioning, an intelligence which can make a ragi dosa into a human being exists right here, but you are not conscious of it, it doesn't exist for you. If it was somewhere and you did not see it, it's okay. If it's within you and you did not see it, this is a tragedy, isn't it? Hello? When there is such a dimension of intelligence which can turn a piece of bread into a human being, 
Should you not delve into it in some way? Should you not find a way to dip your hands into it? If a drop of this intelligence became a, a conscious process within you, <laughs> you will live magically, not miserably, never. And you don't have to worry what to do, what to do. World will come and ask you to do all kinds of things when they see you are elevated. So when you are young, this should be the focus how to build this human being to a place. Not just how to get to that place, that place is only a social place, it's not existential, isn't it? You are a CEO of a company, it's only a social thing, it's not existential. But when you are elevated as a life, it's existential, it stays with you. Whatever is needed in that time in which we exist, we will be able to do it because we have the necessary altitude within us. So now, uh, we are done with our set of questions. Now we would like to open the floor to the audience to ask Sadhguruji their questions. So, uh, who would like to… where are the volunteers? The mics? Uh, I would want to start with this little girl. She had approached me that she wanted to ask you questions, Sadhguruji. So, just could you hand over… yes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, don't floor me with some difficult question, <laughs> Kept that as a surprise. You can stand up, please. Let them see you. Actually, many uh, parents in India, they have tension about their child, about fees, one lakh, two lakh, how shall I pay this, then I'll become a beggar, what shall I do? <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you were a beggar, there would be no problem with one lakh, two lakh. <laughs> then they have a peaceful life, then uh, the parent says the child, I have a very uh, beautiful life, enjoyment. Then after that we think that how do they live happily because they have these many tensions about the child <laughs> that what do they do, how will they fall, why will they uh, kick someone and all that. Then how do they still have a peaceful life, <laughs> the parents? Yes, yes, go on. How do they still have an enjoyment in their life by having a tension still for the kid? <laughs> some parents manage to forget about their children for some time. <laughs> that gives them the respite <laughs> You are something <laughs> So, uh, See, what's your name? Tanjana. Tanjana? Sanjana, I want you to observe, not just your parents, just observe people around you. Just watch them carefully. Because this all I did in my life when I was your age, simply observing everything, not saying a word about it. If you observe people, you will see, today we are creating a world Toddler means uh, <clears throat> they have, you know, <laughs> the napkin problems. Adolescent means they have puberty problems. Middle age means it's a crisis. Old age, terrible. Tell me one stage of life that people are enjoying. Those who are poor, suffering because they are poor. Those who are rich, they are suffering the taxes. <laughs> Those who are not educated, they are suffering because they are not educated. Put them to school, enormous suffering. That's what they are saying, tension in the B school <laughs> And uh, those who are not married, they're suffering. Get them married <laughs> See, I did not say anything. They're saying it. No children, they're suffering. Give them children, constant suffering, <laughs> which you are saying <laughs> Tell me one damn thing that people are not suffering. Everything. So somebody comes out with a seal of philosophy, life is suffering. 
So somebody comes up with a solution, it's all right to suffer, if you suffer a lot here, you will go to another place where everything is fantastic. <laughs> you heard of heaven? Not been there, right? No, heaven. Heaven is the most fantastic place. The reason why we suffer is there everything is fantastic. <laughs> but I'm asking, do you have any proof that you are not already in heaven and messing it up? Hello? Do you have any proof that you are not already in heaven and making a mess out of it? Just go out and see, I think it feels like heaven, the bee school. Maybe me, you making a mess out of it <laughs> Look at this planet, from outside the solar system, look at this planet, all the other planets and planet Earth. Does it look like heaven? So you already landed on heaven and making an absolute mess about it and you want to go to another heaven now because you made a mess out of this. So, people are not s stressed because they have children. They don't have children, they are continuously miserable. Children came little bit spurts of joy, rest is only crying about it. <laughs> So, this is not because of children, this is not because of marriage, this is not because of B-school, this is not because of employment. This is simply because human beings have not figured how to handle themselves, that's all. Wherever do you put them, something. You give them what you want, make, you, make them the king, they are miserable there also. Yes? Yes or no? People have become risen into very high positions, still miserable or no. So this is not because of any situation, definitely not because of a wonderful girl like you. <laughs> huh? They haven't figured because right from the day they went to kindergarten, they were focused who is first, who is second, who is first, who is second. Hmm? Yesterday I was at my school. After forty-five years I went back to my school. How does it feel? How do you think? So I went there and uh, I was just telling them my experience of school. When I went to school, you know this monthly uh, marks card, when I said monthly, don't think I'm talking menstrual cycles or something. <laughs> I'm talking about monthly marks card, it almost felt like that for a lot of people <laughs> because that's how they went through it. When this marks card comes, when the teacher gives it to them, some look at it and they're strutting around because they are first, second, whatever. Some are sitting in one corner and crying because they're not happy with the numbers that they got. I never opened the marks card in my entire school. When they gave it to me, I took it and gave it to my father. He blew. <laughs> I couldn't understand why just this card. I never opened it and saw because I thought this is a transaction between my teacher and him. <laughs> I had no… <laughs> I had no interest in it whatsoever. So I never bothered, but I always saw it. My father is a well-educated, intelligent man, but uh, it disturbed him. For three days he blew like a volcano. Looking at this yellow card, they always give a yellow colored card, still like that? <laughs> so, I was wondering three days volcanic experience he's having. Why I'm saying this is, we have set this kind of things. We can't change the entire system tomorrow morning, but we can change ourselves, how we handle this, isn't it? Why is it so important that you have to be ahead of somebody. Why? Why is it so important? Is it not important your life should be beautiful? Hmm? You must be joyful, you must be wonderful, you must explore your full potential. Is this important or you want to be better than somebody sitting next to you? Well, if what's sitting next to you is a piece of dung, you will be a little better dung. Yes? <laughs> That's not how life should end up. 
So don't blame yourself for uh, anybody's suffering. They're like that, they're practiced, you know, just many have become veterans in suffering because uh, they're acclimatizing themselves to go to hell. <laughs> Acclimatization process. They want to make themselves such a suffering here, even if you drop them in hell, it'll feel wonderful. <laughs> you… you… you never blame yourself for somebody's misery, okay? It's all right. What to do? It's individual choice, huh? Yes or no? Outside people, what can we do? What can I do to you? I can create a easy situation or a difficult situation for you. Suffering is your business, isn't it? Yes or no? Suffering is your business. Either you can be a challenging child for your parents, I wish you will be, because otherwise they will become like Bishibale Bhatta. <laughs> you must be a little challenging for them. So whether they enjoy the challenge or suffer, the challenge is left to them. Am I? Is it okay? <laughs> because uh, what I see is, it doesn't matter how many arrangements you make, those who suffer anyway suffer, isn't it? Just… just see the Western countries as an example. What everybody is dreaming of, or what even people don't dare to dream here, an average American citizen has. You think they're all bursting with joy? All the arrangements have been made. You think they're bursting in joy? No misery! Forty-two percent of population over forty-five is on, you know, psychiatric medication. So this is not joy for sure. Even mental health is not being managed because just making external arrangements is not going to fix this life. It's very, very important that you make inner arrangements that even if they send you to hell, you will go joyfully. You heard of Gautama, the Buddha? You heard of Buddha? When everybody was talking about going to heaven, Gautama said, what will I go and do in heaven? Because you say everything is wonderful there, what will I do there? Let me go to hell, because you say everybody is suffering there, let me go and do something because anyway I cannot suffer. I made myself like this, I cannot suffer, so let me go to hell. Even now the Buddhist texts talk about Buddha being in the lower world. <coughs> well, you should have this kind of freedom, isn't it so? Huh? Even if I go to hell, I will live well. Nobody has to send me to heaven. You can go to the next question. Oh. There, please. If possible. This is a cricketing country, you can throw it, he will catch it. <laughs> uh, so my question is, we students sitting over here are among the top percentile in the country in terms of education that we are receiving. Yet all of us are wondering about what jobs we will get, we just want the best campus placements over here. If that's the scenario with the… with all of us and we are not willing to take risks and have become risk averse, from where will the jobs come for the country when we are not thinking about starting our own ventures, our own startups, our own firms? Sir, we also have our NSR cell here which incubates startups in Am Bangalore. <laughs> Incubation is only for an unhatched egg. Now, uh, see, India is a developing country, is that so? What a developing country means is, so much is still undone, many, many things to be done. In this country, nobody should be talking about unemployment, if you ask me, because there is so much to be done. Now, the problem is, you want only that certain kind of job where you will get the maximum pay without doing the needed work. <laughs> yes, otherwise it's a developing country. There are million things yet to be done in this country. 
This is not a developed country, what shall I do, everything is done. No, there are too many things yet to be done. So, if you have a working brain and a seeing eye, if you look around, there are thousand things to be done right around you, isn't it? So, I don't think you should be looking in terms of campus placement. The word placement sounds like you're in a hospice. <laughs> this should not be the attitude of the youth. What are you going to lose if you take a risk? I'm asking, what are you going to lose? Your friend may get into McKinsey, is that it? <laughs> That's not the way to look at life. There is so much to be done in the world. If you have the brains and the guts to do something, there is so much to be done in this world, isn't it? Particularly in India. So, I would like to see from this institution that uh, little more dare in you, nothing will happen. You are not in that condition like uh, the little girl expressed, even she's not that, if I don't do this, I will fall on the street, I will become a beggar. No, that will not happen to you. Are you sure about that or no? That will not happen to you, uh, but if you are enterprising, can… you think the world can stop you? No, the world will put obstacles in your way. Either you can see them as obstacles or you can see them as possibilities always. Where there is a problem, there is a possibility, isn't it so? Hello? Yes. Wherever there is a problem, there is a possibility. That is, if you start looking, what's the solution for this problem? If you just see the problem and you don't think beyond that, that a problem is a great possibility because if you solve this, that's it. There are lots of problems in our country. Please see how to solve it, that's what you should invest in <laughs> Namaste. Namaste. Uh, my name is Danya Ravi mm -hmm. and firstly I would love to express my gratitude to Sadhguruji for establishing Isha Foundation and Isha, Isha Music because for me music heals a lot, that's one of the tools I use. Uh, whenever I come across any problem and there is no day that goes by without listening to Isha music. <laughs> I'm very grateful to you for that. And <laughs> yeah, so talking about my health condition, I'm born with a rare genetic disease called osteogenesis imperfecta, commonly known as brittle bone disease, which means my bones are extremely fragile just like a glass and I face more number of fractures than the number of bones in anyone's body. So today I, more than a question, I have a humble wish. I'm a regular follower of your everyday saying, so it would be nice if one of the coming days, if you could quote something about disability as I believe uh, this opportunity would create a wider visibility for survivors of people with disability. And yeah, I would be happy if that quote is done along with our pic. <laughs> along with? Our pic. <laughs> oh. Photograph. Photograph. Oh, we will. Yeah, along yes, with our photograph. So I'm if you're... a good picture. No, I need you and me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> and... uh, please, this is this is entirely for uh, my request for this is entirely for spreading awareness about rare yes. diseases because uh, it's only through awareness. It can be controlled. Mm -hmm. I thank you so much. And yeah, Sadhguruji, I'm hoping it happens sometime very soon. <laughs> yeah, very soon. Thank you. <laughs> it's our privilege to have you here. <laughs> well, well there's another question. Your maybe? Oh, sorry, sir. <laughs> question. 
You see, different people have different types of disabilities <laughs> And I will do that, we will do that. Uh, see, uh, life has come in so many forms, but societies have decided what is normal and what is not normal. But actually, if we compare every one of you who have all the four limbs intact and whatever, you compare to the next person, in some aspect of life, are you not disabled? Hmm? If you run with Mr. Bolt, won't you feel like a cripple? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> with two good legs, won't you feel like a cripple? Yes. So let's not uh, brand ourselves or anybody else one way or the other because life has come in so many ways. You just have to respect that and do your best about it. Because it's a miracle in the sense, just now Sesang was talking about the miracle that he did today morning, that he makes ragi dosa into a human being. <laughs> Isn't it a miracle? And this ragi dosa was made with the soil that we walk upon, yes or no? Hmm? just the soil which became food and food which became flesh and bone. In such a phenomenally complex process which we have taken for granted, unfortunately, certain things sometimes don't… did not work the way we think it should be. So, never call yourself disabled. Well, you're one way, I'm another way. I am disabled in one way, you are disabled in another way. Some way, every one of us, if we compare ourselves to somebody, all of us are disabled in some sense, isn't it? But see what an intelligent mind you have. Because of my disability, I am here today. Otherwise, I am And because of that, we are going to have a court. <laughs> I am saying, bones are breaking, it's painful, unfortunate. But mo most people who… who are being labeled as normal, they are all breaking up their brains every day, hmm? Not bones, brains. <laughs> they call it stress, they call it anxiety, they call it so many things. But uh, literally, breaking up the brain, isn't it, in some way? The whys and whats are not necessary because we need to understand the physical form is a mechanical process. Sometimes things will go wrong with it. It may come normal and go wrong or in the very womb manufacturing something can go wrong. This has got nothing to do with that person. It's got something to do with variety of things because it's such a complex process. Such a complex process that something little off sometimes. But that should not determine what and how you live, because how we live physically may be determined by many things. But how we live within ourselves, nobody can decide except us, isn't it? Hmm? Nobody else can decide how I live within myself. So in that sense, nobody is disabled. Why spiritual process is very important is because in body, no person can claim he has a perfect body because somebody else could be in some other way. If it comes to mind, nobody can claim that they have a perfect mind. All of us disabled in some way physically, mentally, compared to somebody else, isn't it? But a dimension which is beyond this physiology and psychology, the psychological, and the physiological dimensions beyond this, that dimension which we unfortunately have to use this corrupted word called spirituality, in this state, our life is just same. 
the reason and the significance of why a spiritual process must be prevalent across the planet is, spiritual process does not mean looking up or looking down, it's about turning inward and touching a dimension beyond our physiological and psychological structures. In this state, there is simply no difference between you and me and anybody and anybody. This is why it becomes significant. We can talk about equality as much as we want, but when we use our body or physical presence as the front end, there is no equality. Do what you want. If we use our mind as the front end, no equality, do whatever you want. One is like that, one is like this, one is like that, this is how it is. But if we use this dimension of life which is beyond our body and mind, these two accumulations of body and mind, beyond this if you look, here everything is same. If this one experience enters humanity, you will find a very fabulously inclusive existence here. Doesn't matter who has come with what capability or not, everything, every life will have a place. But right now, we are setting standards based on physiological and psychological competence and saying, this is standard, this is substandard. No, don't do that because can you say a carrot is a lesser life than you? Hmm? Or a grasshopper is a lesser life than you? Because they can live without you, you cannot live without them. That's a fact, isn't it? They can very easily live without you, but you cannot live without them. Nature has given us this possibility that today we have the intelligence to be above all this life. But when you rise to a certain level, it's very important if you're a crude nonsense, you will think this is a time to dominate. Or if you rise to a certain level where rest of the life knowingly or unknowingly is looking up to you, this is a time to include and merge with everything. This is not a time to dominate, isn't it? Because once you dominate, you alienate from everything. I'm telling you because you're all going to be managers. If you want to manage people, I was uh, teaching a three-day program to one of the top companies in the world, twenty-five top managers of that company, an international giant. They were about thirty-five people, uh, twenty-five people, and uh, our volunteers were about nine volunteers. So we were doing this program. Our volunteers are like made like this day and night. The basic qualification is you're crazy, you know. That means you're not thinking what will happen to you, what will I get? Nobody is thinking, simply they're working their life out. So they saw them like this and said, Sadhguru, where do you get such people? Because these are companies which are always looking for attrition. I said, you don't get them, you got to make them. How do you… how do you make such people? I said, you should make them fall in love with you. Oh, because once they're in love with you, they will do whatever is needed. Now, how do you make them fall in love with us? I said, first you must fall in love with them. I said, oh, they don't pay us for that <laughs> So once you try to dominate, you alienate. Once you alienate, it's hell to manage people, it's hell. It's better you take sannyas and live somewhere alone because managing even one person when they're alienated from you is hell. In inclusion, management will happen effortlessly. So this inclusion has to come means human life or human beings have to come to at least a little bit of inner experience which is beyond body, which is beyond mind because when it comes to body, your body is different, my body is different. Do what you want, this will stay different. We will think it's different at least, as long as we live, 
Only when they bury us, we know it's all the same soil. When you compare mentally, my mind is different, your mind is different, do what you want, they will always remain different. But if you look at this as life, there is no such thing as my life and your life. This is a living cosmos. The question is only how much of life did you capture in this? This is all that matters. It's not the size of the body, it's not the size of your brain. How much life did you capture within yourself will determine the scale and scope of life. How big a life you live simply depends on how much life have you captured. So if you want to capture more life than you have right now, the simple thing that you have to no do is, you must open up the boundaries of your individuality. Your individuality is slowly becoming a concrete shell that nobody can break through. If you obliterate the boundaries of your individuality, then we say this is yoga. Yoga does not mean twisting your body, turning upside down, wearing lulu pants. <laughs> yoga means union. Union means the boundaries of your individuality, consciously you obliterate it. Now, there is a life larger than anybody can imagine happening within you. Because of a large-scale life, everything will come naturally your way. You don't have to go and set up your shop in a busy place. Wherever you set up, they will come. They cannot help. I must tell you this from experience. In continuation, we're talking, okay? <laughs> when uh, we want to set up the yoga center, I went and chose a place which had no road, which is just right next to the rainforest and it's remote as it can get. It's a proper uh, revenue land, but remote, nobody would want to go there. When I said this, this is where I want to set up the yoga center. We had a trust, it's a foundation. Out of six trustees, four of them dropped out because they thought I'm crazy. They wanted to find a five-acre plot inside the city or just next to the city, start a center where people will come. They said, nobody is going to come, this man has lost his mind. Well, today it's become one of the most prominent places in the country, in the world actually. <laughs> Similarly, in United States, we went and set up a center in the remotest possible place in Tennessee. People said, Sadhguru, this is not the place to go. Tennessee is a different kind of place. It's a very uh, strong religious place, extreme, Bible Belt. They said, Sadhguru, you don't know, just the previous year, they'd burned down a Zen meditation center. Sadhguru, this happened, you don't go there. I said, see, we were, this was all in the northern area in Michigan. So I said, see, I know how to transform people, but I don't know how to change the weather. So I go Tennessee. <laughs> and they said, why in such a remote place? I said, see, I don't know how you look at it. I looked at this map of United States. I drove across, crisscrossed United States just to look at the terrain and the temperatures and things. Then I said, this is the place. I looked at the map and said, this is where, because if I draw a twelve-hour drive kind of circle, sixty percent of United States population is around us. I said, this is where I will be. In the remote, remote place, because it's so remote, we bought over two thousand acres and today it's a buzzing center. Uh, why I'm saying all this to you is because for a low-hanging fruit, you live a low-hanging life simply because something seems to be easy right now. But if you are very clear what you want to create, whether it's a business or an industry or you just want to make yourself… Above all, what kind of human being do you want to become? That's the most important thing. Don't start any enterprise or job, all these things are on the side. The real thing is, what kind of life will this become? This is the real thing, isn't it? If you just focus on this one thing, 
If you obliterate your boundaries of your individuality, you will see this will become a large-scale life. When it becomes a large-scale life, everything that happens around you will be of a certain scale naturally. Of course, some things are decided by times in which we live. If you were an IT professional a thousand years ago, you wouldn't know what to do, isn't it? So there are times <laughs> uh, Namaste Sajguruji. Uh, the question is that uh, you have spoken about to live the life uh, considering there's no goals. So my question was that how to experience the life like which, which you spoke till now. Uh, there are no goals and you have to just experience, you have to elevate yourself. So I wanted to know how to experience your life. So how do I experience my life? You don't have to do anything to experience, experience is happening all the time, isn't it? The question is only whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. Hello? Is some experience happening right now? Yes. Experience is happening to you through five senses right now by seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching. This is the way your experience is happening. If you observe this experience, it's not really reliable to know life. It's reliable enough for survival process, but it's not reliable enough to know because everything that you know through your five sense organs is only by comparison. That is why this whole business of comparing yourself to somebody because senses can only know by comparison. You know what's light only because there is darkness, isn't it? You know what's big only because you've seen something small. So, everything is by comparison. When you know everything by comparison, it's all right for survival, but it's not good enough to know life. So about knowing life will not happen if your perception is limited to five senses. It needs to go beyond that. Only when that happens, your boundaries of your individuality are taken away and that's when life happens in large proportions. I think you're trying to make a philosophy of what you heard, that's a big problem. Don't draw a conclusion. I came here to see that I can remove some conclusions in your mind so that you're a open life. But you're trying to draw a conclusion, what is the takeaway? No takeaway. Don't take away anything. Just. Just walk out into the world a little more conscious and alive, that's the thing. Thank you very much. <laughs>